Hey everybody, Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. That's my colleague Chris White behind the camera. Here's Aaron Rowland and of the West Point Museum, and we are at the West Point Cemetery. Tell me a little bit about this place. Uh, yeah, so we're uh, we're here to explore one of the more somber topics of the uh, the history of West Point here. Uh, so, and that is the cemetery. Uh, there's a lot of notable uh, people that are buried here, um, but it dates back clear almost uh, essentially to the uh, West Point's founding in the uh, during the War of Independence. So behind me here are some of the uh, the oldest graves in the cemetery. So the earliest ones actually do date to the War of Independence. Uh, so you have such individuals as the Warner sisters that are buried here. Uh, you also have an ensign that was born uh, in, uh, what was it, County Cork, Ireland, yes. I believe. So you have several individuals here that are from the War of Independence. However, we have other notables uh, that are buried in the cemetery as well, to include Winfield Scott, who is just to my right, your left, uh, Sylvanus there, the father of the U.S. Military Academy, and even more recent graduates such as Jumpin' James Gavin, a, a lieutenant general uh, known for commanding the 82nd Airborne Division during the Second World War and the uh, the D-Day operations. So there's a lot of notable, uh, a lot of notoriety here in the, the the West Point Cemetery. Thanks, Aaron. So what we're going to do on this particular video is talk about uh, at least uh, 18 or 19 of the. Gettysburg related uh, burials we have just around us. So we're going to just take a short walk. We don't even have to walk to point out the first one. I see Norman J. Hall back there of Fredericksburg fame, of I believe Fort Sumter fame, and certainly of Gettysburg fame. So here's somebody you uh, might have heard about. Of course, he's right on Cemetery Ridge during the Battle of Gettysburg. And if Chris, if you'll just turn around here and we'll start looking at more, directly in front of the camera is going to be who, who Chris? Who is that? So we're looking at John Buford. Buford is the leader of the 1st Cav Division of the Army of the Potomac. He's a West Point graduate. Uh, he's from uh, Kentucky, and he is going to be one of the best Cav leaders in the entire Union Army. And uh, he dies in December of 1863. So on here, this is uh, showing that he's a major general. He was basically made a major general on his deathbed. Uh, but Buford is buried here beside a large number of other uh, veterans of Gettysburg. And if you look right past Buford, you might be able to see, uh, somewhat in relief, uh, Hugh Judson Kilpatrick Kill Cavalry, who was, of course, leading a division at Gettysburg. And then if we'll skip the one next to it, because we'll get back to Alonzo Cushing here, here's Benjamin Grimes Davis. Now, he is not specifically Gettysburg, but it's Gettysburg Campaign. This is at the opening of the Battle of Brandy Station, June 9th, 1863, when he gets into a, literally a duel with one other particular colonel. Anything to add to that, Chris? I would add that uh, during the siege of Harper's Ferry, is he who fights his way out of Harper's Ferry. Yes. He doesn't want to surrender, rides his way out before Stonewall Jackson captures uh, the army there under Nelson Miles, which is the largest surrender of United States forces until Corregidor in 1940. Too. Well, and let's say, you know, Aaron, you mentioned uh, General Scott, so let's focus there on uh, Ranald McKenzie over there, who seems to fight in the entire Civil War. He's a brand new graduate of West Point, and he seems to be all over the place from the beginning of the war till the end of the war. He is wounded uh, at Gettysburg in a staff position. He's wounded later in the war as well. I believe it's Winfield Scott who called him one of the most promising young officers in the Army. Now, Right here we are on to Alonzo Cushing, who needs very little introduction. Aaron, Chris, you want to take this one? Uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, so Alonzo Cushing is, uh, he's most notable for his, uh, his actions that occurred on the, uh, the 3rd of July during uh, the, the Pickett's Charge. Uh, however, one thing that our viewers should know is that for a very brief time when, uh, when his when his Medal of Honor was first awarded, we had uh, we had the honor at the West Point Museum of actually displaying publicly uh, Alonzo Cushing's Medal of Honor. So right there in our the lobby of our museum, we had the honor of uh, of displaying Alonzo Cushing's Medal of Honor. All right, let's walk a little bit further here. Uh, if you go over to the left there, Chris, you might also see Thomas Ruger, brigade and division commander at the Battle of Gettysburg in the 12th Corps. Uh, you have to sort of look down toward uh, Geary's division, and then you'll see that Ruger is a brigade commander. Maybe I'm confusing him with Williams. Sorry, he's in Williams' division. Uh, Chris is nodding his head. And uh, when Williams takes over the Corps, Ruger takes over the division, and Colgrove takes over, uh, I believe, his particular brigade. So these guys are over at Spangler Spring and Environs, also leaving that area to go over toward uh, the Union left as well. 
And uh, Ruger is also a future superintendent of West Point in the 1870s. Yes, he is. Now, we have so much to cover because we've got two different Gettysburg Corps commanders. We've got George Sykes. In fact, if you'll just pan to the right there, Chris, here's the back of his. We'll show you uh, on B-roll uh, the front of it. So George Sykes is here. We got John Newton a little bit off of our pass. You've got two uh, Corps commanders. We've got, I think, five division commanders here in Merritt and Buford. Um, that's Wesley Merritt. We already talked about Buford. Uh, we talked about Kilpatrick and Ruger. So that's four additional division commanders. We've got five battery commanders as well as uh, a good number, I think seven cavalry commanders as well. In fact, there's Wesley Merritt right over there um, off to the left. So I think this is starting to dictate sort of our route. Everywhere you look, if you're a Civil War uh, enthusiast, you'll start to see names that appear familiar to you. And we're confining ourselves mostly to the Gettysburg campaign here. It's to say nothing about the dozens of others that you can talk about while you're here. Um, we've already passed by a few, but uh, Thomas Devon and Alexander Stuart Webb are actually coming up on our left, as is a battery commander, John C. Tidball, who seemed to fight uh, throughout the entire war. Um, and, uh, and with great distinction as well. If you're looking at Buford's division, two of his three brigade commanders are buried here in this cemetery who served at Gettysburg. The only one we're missing is William Gamble. Wow. And just a, a quick note on Tidball, he actually, for a very brief period, kind of in the middle of the war, he actually served as the Commandant of the Corps of Cadets here at West Point. Were we to go further to the front and right, we would come across Dan Butterfield. Who wants to say a few words about Dan Butterfield? Dan Butterfield is the chief of staff for the Union Army during the Gettysburg Campaign. He had uh, been a brigade commander, rose to Corps Command um, briefly, and then was replaced by George Gordon Meade with the Fifth Army Corps. Um, and then Butterfield becomes the chief of staff for the Army of the Potomac under Joe Hooker. Um, there's some great quotes about <laughs> Dan, uh, Dan Butterfield. Dan Sickles, the third corps commander, and Joe Hooker when they were all in command of the Army of the Potomac together, um, or at least in the high command. It was uh, a place where no respected man liked to go and where no woman could go uh, because it was such a um, barroom and a brothel, according to some folks. But Butterfield turned out to be a very good uh, chief of staff until later on in life when he kind of turned on George Gordon Meade. But Butterfield, with this very ornate monument here, has a monument at Fredericksburg as well. And Butterfield comes from family money. He's not a West Point graduate, but his father's one of the founding members of the American Express Company. Aaron, did you there's there? yeah, there's actually one other uh, one other neat connection between uh, General Butterfield and well during the Battle of Gettysburg, Captain Tidball, and that was the fact that uh, while it was Butterfield that has given the uh, the credit for creating taps for mil military funerals today, it is actually uh, John C. Tidball that was given credit for actually having taps sounded over the uh, the graves of. Uh, the men and women who have fallen uh, in the line of, uh, of duty in service to their nation. And you're actually right, you know, it's interesting. And, and, and people in the know really question whether Butterfield created it. But I don't think people really question that it was Tidball who uh, is properly credited for actually playing it uh, um, at funerals. Now, uh, yeah, we should also mention that Butterfield is a Medal of Honor recipient. Indeed. And you can see many of the battles in which he was involved list, uh, labeled around the columns as well. Now, we've got a couple off to our right here, but before we leave, let's mention some of the people off to our left, including Tully McRae. Of course, he's uh, an assistant, sort of a second in command of, of uh, Woodruff's Battery on Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg. You've got Alexander Pennington. Chris, who's that? Uh, Alexander Pennington is going to command the guns on East Cav Field on the third day at Gettysburg. His battery will be out there dueling with Stewart's guns, Robert Beckham's horse artillery, um, and that'll be uh, one of his overlooked actions at the Battle of Gettysburg. Let's stick with the battery commanders because we didn't mention one John Califf, who is a little bit off to the right, and we can't quite see him from here, but uh, he's going to be prominent uh, on the first day at Gettysburg. Uh, I would, some might say, sort of after opening the battle in terms of uh, the gun. And then coming up on our left here is going to be Julian Weir. Uh, this uh, soldier is going to be with his battery out along the Emmitsburg Road. Anything to add on that, Chris? Yeah, it's uh, overlooked action at Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 2nd as the Emmitsburg Road positions falling, the Third Corps positions falling. Uh, New York troops and Massachusetts troops will go out there with Brown's, <coughs> Brown's battery as well as Julian Weir's battery to try to give cover 
to um, the right flank of Sickles' men. They're going to be driven back towards Cemetery Ridge, and that's where you're going to start to see uh, <clears throat> the high watermark of the July 2nd battle, including uh, Rand's rights for Georgians overrunning that position and heading towards what we will call later on the high watermark. And we would really encourage you to study um, that part of the action, that uh, Emmitsburg Road fight on July 2nd, 1863. Weir would certainly want you uh, to study it, as would uh, the men of Anderson's Confederate Division making that attack. This is an unsung sort of part of the fight which produced a tremendous number of casualties and created one of the greatest emergencies for the Union Army at Gettysburg. Um, I think by my account, we only have one other main uh, grave to cover, and it's one that uh, is uh, controversial in terms of uh, whether it's a grave or not. I don't think anybody could question uh, his actions uh, in really helping to defeat the Confederates uh, on East Cavalry Field, taking a lot of his own initiative uh, and really saying, come on, you Wolverines, and leading his men into battle. During the Civil War, this was um, a general who, you know, might have been smirked at, but was not questioned in terms of his bravery. Chris or Aaron? Yeah, I would add that this uh, grave site is not a grave. It's actually a monument that's been moved here. So what you're looking at is the base of a monument to George Armstrong Custer, where the obelisk sits at the top here would have actually once been an image of George Custer himself kind of striding forward with pistols in hand um, into battle. Uh, and uh, Libby Custer, who's his wife, who's actually buried just to the right of where we're standing right now, did not like the likeness of George. So she had it taken down that part of it destroyed and then moved the base over here. So you'll notice that we have this plaque here, this bronze plaque, a bas relief of a buffalo with a Native American. We have tomahawks and every and war spears. And then on this side, we have Custer himself. And then down here, we will have the name Custer. And then up on the added obelisk, George Armstrong Custer, Major General, U.S. Volunteers. So this is a repurposed grave site, if you will, uh, or grave marker that was once a monument, taken down at the request of the wife, and moved here to the West Point Cemetery. Gary said that this is a little bit of controversial monument in some ways because we don't know if Custer's actually under here. But uh, Custer was originally buried with his men at the Little Bighorn. Eventually, the army goes out there, starts exhuming um, remains, and the remains of Custer were brought back here. Were they the remains of George Custer, maybe one of his other men? We don't know for sure. There is someone in Custer's grave. We don't know if it's Jorm's Armstrong Custer, um, per se. I would just add that we have one more Gettysburg connection up here, and that is one of the Eisenhowers. Um, and that would be John Eisenhower, the second son of Ike and Mamie. He's actually buried up here next to Winfield Scott, the Eisenhower Farms at Gettysburg. And John was there with his father um, from time to time and helping to run his farm there. Um, so John Eisenhower is unofficially a Gettysburg native, we'll call him that. And this is his grave here right beside that of Winfield Scott and right beside or almost beside George Sykes. And I'll just close by saying that uh, you know, we hope you enjoy this video, but more so we hope that it might uh, convince you that this is a critical stop for um, Gettysburg enthusiasts uh, to pay your respects to some of the officers um, of the North who fought at that particular battle. And we think you're going to find dozens of other people whom you find interesting and of whom you have heard. So uh, Chris behind the camera, we're all kind of behind the camera this time, as well as Aaron and to West Point for providing access and meticulously maintaining this cemetery. We thank you very much for watching and for supporting battlefield preservation and education.